Today is Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay. Hey, where are you coming from, Dave? I'm coming from Franklin, Tennessee. Franklin, Tennessee. How far away are you from uh, Ingram's uh, facility? About 35 minutes on a good day. Oh, not, not bad. Not bad. Have you been over there? No, actually, I met with them a couple of times at, at coffee shops around here. It's just kind of uh, easier uh, in that respect and a lot more uh, or less formal. But uh, I've never really taken a tour of the place. Have you? I, I have not, but I'm, I'm on their hit list, I think. So uh, to, ah, to, to, come, to, come, to come and make a visit. And also tomorrow we have Robin Cutler from Ingram Spark on, on the show. So, uh, yeah, just Ingram's on my mind. Um, we have one human watching us. Ooh. Thank you, Lawrence, for joining us, being first hey, to comment and letting us know that you're here. And most importantly, that you can see us, which uh, M Michael and I went on on Saturday. And uh, we talked for five minutes and nobody came up. And we're like, what the hell? So we went over to Facebook and we're both checking. We're like, we're not live. It said we were live, but we weren't live. So we re rebooted it. And uh, hey, then we came up. It's weird. So yeah, one never knows. All right. D Dave is here to talk about everything related to getting your book in front of people. And before we went live, he was talking about a uh, like the eye mapping check that he had uh, had done looking where do potential buyers look when looking at your product page? You want to talk about that, Dave? That's that's it. That it fascinates me. Yeah, actually. So um, a bit ago, I paid a company to bring in a bunch of people, like hundreds of people to sit in front of a computer and they were shown an Amazon sales page, an Amazon book sales page. And what it would do is, is that the computer would monitor where their eyes were in proportion to where the screen was to see not only where they were looking, but also where they were clicking. And we were really uh, strategic about it because we had certain types of readers come in. So we had like, we could only break it down to like fantasy and then we'd show them a fantasy book. We would have science fiction. Uh, I even had one of my favorites, which is lit RPG. Just, I wanted that kind of group just to see that just cause I love those books. Um, and it was incredible what we saw from what they saw. And I, bummer is I can't bring up a uh, screen share. We were talking about that, but I do yeah. have some generated heat maps that I'm gonna be put publishing out later um, where I want people to be able to see what customers really care about. Now, you may be sitting there saying to yourself, well, I'm a customer, I'm a reader, you know, I know it's important, but we found some really interesting things. Um, to bring up some of the stuff, first off, we found out that I mean, this kind of makes sense, but the cover is always the most engaged thing. Everybody looks at it. But what I thought was really interesting was that we started to notice that the hottest parts on the cover were what I would what I'd call genre components, right? So like, for example, in the one that I have up on my screen now, uh, I actually borrowed one of my favorite books, Rogue Dungeon. Uh, it's a lit RPG. And it, the biggest focus was on the giant ogre in the background. Like that's what people hmm. looked at. Not not the title, which the title's really cool the way that they designed it, but the ogre. And I think to me, if I were to interpret that, I would look at it and say to myself, you know, I'll bet that it was them looking at it because they want it. <laughs> I just saw Hal's uh, comment. <laughs> yeah, that, that probably gets a lot of a heat map. Um, but with regards to the ogre, I think people are looking at it and just reaffirming in their mind that this is the right genre, that this is the right kind of fantasy that, that they want. And so yeah. that ogre got the most. The second thing we also noticed was the hook. The first part of your book description got a lot of attention. Um, yep. And I think that really just goes to stress how important that first sentence is to your book description. And we also noticed that there's higher click percentage based off of how good they were. But here's that's the best a, and, part. And, and that's one thing we push. I personally push really, really hard in 20 books to 50 K is when I tell people, give me your hook one sentence, yep. you're like, well, I need multiple sentences. No, you, you, you no. don't want multiple sentences. You need one sentence really. So yeah, yeah. Keep, I'm sorry. Keep going. Yeah. And I, I call them mic drop moments. If that, if that hook isn't good enough that you can feel like when you say it, you can drop a mic and walk away. Uh, yeah. then keep, keep working on it. And we found that there was a huge correlation between having a good hook, subjectively what we thought was a good hook, um, and getting the click to read more 
to see more of that book description. Another thing that we also noticed too was is that um, bolding the hook at the top had a much higher engagement. It drew the eyes to read it. In nonfiction, some people were actually using like symbols or kind of like asterisks or dashes to kind of put next to it. That really picked it up as well. So those Weird. are just some of the, the parts that we saw uh, just from the heat map studies. Another big thing, this is this is the crazy part. Um, when it came to reviews, do you know which review got the most engagement? You know how at the bottom of your sales page, there's all these reviews, right? The one that got the yeah. most engagement were the ones that were usually three stars. Okay. Not yep. the five star and not the one star. What we mm -hmm. found was is that people would look at the first one briefly, you know, just kind of scan it. And then they would scroll until they saw what I'm guessing is what they think is an impartial uh, review. One that will say the pros and cons. And that mm -hmm. one by far got the most read. Like the person would read it all the way through. The okay. ones got to scan just to see if there was maybe something legitimate or scathing about it. Yeah. But the three, and if there isn't a three, then the two or the four by far got the most read. So I know that we as authors can't control our reviews, but I assure you that two, three, or four is going to have the most impact than the fives or the ones. So I can't give you advice on what you can do with that, but I think it gives you a better understanding of what gets the most traction out of the reviews you end up getting. And your and your overall embrace of what's a good review. Oh my God, I got a three review, but you wrote good words. That is perfect. And those yep. are my favorite reviews. One of my one of one of the best reviews ever was okay, it's written like this, YA, not my usual genre. Already I know I'm down to four stars. And here's what I liked about it. And I'm going to keep reading three stars. I'm like, that is awesome because it yeah. drew the eye. It, it was read more and you could see it was well, well written, not with a bunch of, uh, you know, you know, misspellings and stuff like that, where somebody was like jamming it angrier with the, with, with the, you know, a single thumb and, uh, and, and drop it. And, and those I could say, yes, most influential. I'd love to copy it and paste it up in the, in the, uh, in the blurb. Here, here's a three star. So, you know, you, you know, you're going to like the story. Yeah, so that's exactly. What, that's how I think. And I think it brings but, a lot of trust to uh, to it. So uh, one thing I guess I could say, especially since we have a lot of authors who have a lot of author friends out there um, or there's just authors they really love and follow. If you want to have the most impactful moment to them, I'm not saying give them a two star because that still hurts. Right. Um, yeah. But dropping a three or a four isn't a bad thing if you feel that's a good way of doing it. But the second thing is, is we also found that if you include a picture, I mean, you holding the book or just the book itself, that also really brought the eyes to that review. Um, you know, also to any books that had a video review, that that was huge as well. So if you really wanted oh to God. go above and beyond for an author, you could really help their, their books sales page do much better by just doing those two extra small steps or a uh, if you get an endorsement review get it with the book hey i've got this book and and, and there's a, a a new york times bestseller saying i've got this book and i'm reading it and i like it that, yeah. that is simple enough especially if it's a video you know as if you could get james patterson saying hey i read clancy i like his books oh well of course you're going to sell but still getting into the mind of your favorite author or whatever is a, is a good way to go about it. I, I, I like that. That's good. You can, uh, I, I don't leave reviews because I don't want to be seen as the guy uh, uh, brokering review uh, trades or anything like that. So I, I generally don't leave any reviews, but you can leave a picture in a review or a video. Yep. Yeah. Man, this is that's good to know. Another, another section that was really interesting as well was the editorial review section. Um, and I'm, I harp, all the time to authors seriously set up an editorial review section and our heat map shows that it gets looks, but not in the way you think it does. Um, so there were a couple of things about this. An editorial review for anybody who doesn't know is where you can pretty much put anything you want. Like it's hilarious how much leeway you have in the editorial review. It can be a friend and then they Amazon literally says this. It can be a friend. It could be a family member. It could be a professional. It doesn't matter. This is your time for anybody mm -hmm. to post whatever they want. Okay. Um, yeah. so in the editorial review, if you're not using that, that's prime real estate 
for your shoppers to see any credibility. Here's what I recommend though. We saw from the heat map that most people, when they go to the editorial review, they don't actually read the review. They read who left the review. So one of the things we saw is that if you are writing your editorial review, I recommend that you keep whatever the review is short, don't give it a giant paragraph, but then you bold the name or or the who they are uh, in the industry. Just that, because that's what the eyes cared about. And when you yeah. bolded it, they got even more attention. So you may be yep. saying, okay, great. Well, you know, I don't want to post from my mother, right? <laughs> you know, uh, author's mom. However, though, reach out to authors in the, you know, other authors in the industry to see if they would give a editor view. If you have connections like that, and then you should. Um, and and your the, book is worthy. <laughs> well, and yeah, exactly. But also too, though, is, is that you, you know, if you put the author's name, maybe that person's not super famous. Um, you know, there's only a, a handful of authors in the lit RPG, you know, industry that I would know just like that and be like, oh, snap, he got so-and-so. That's cool. Yeah. But what they can though see is that it's a, they're a best-selling lit RPG author. That is at least credence to say that other lit RPG authors that are good writers had something good to say about this book. And that's all the shopper wants to know that there okay. is some credibility there. So if you don't have the super famous person or something like that, or you don't have the connections, you know, to get a, a name that's recognizable, then translate the name to something that connects your book to legitimacy. Okay. So if you're writing a nonfiction about health, if you can get a doctor, don't just put Dr. So-and-so, but Dr. So-and-so of such and such area, if you can. So it translates that this isn't just a random doctor, but this is somebody who knows that. Um, another thing, and you know, we talked about just translating the books they write. Another thing too is, is that if you can, there are blogs out there that are legitimate or they have a legitimate mm -hmm. blog name that means a lot. Uh, for example, there's a website out there called topscifibooks.com. Um, we probably don't know that website because you probably haven't been been to it. However, though, if you're writing a science fiction book and topscifibooks.com says, doesn't even matter whatever it says, but there is a editor review from a website that's titled that, that's that's huge, even though that website isn't huge. Um, yeah. And so it's really, we found that the editor review is the section where shoppers are just looking for legitimacy. They're not actually okay. looking at the review. They're just looking at who is backing this book. And when it's there and it's done this way, it's really powerful. We'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll let people digest all that information while I, while I wax poetic. The, uh, your uh, uh, blurb generator that uh, I recommend to everybody uh, that's on your website, I use it. And I had the pleasure of, of testing out the next generation of that. Have you rolled that out yet? So we have, I think it's coming out in two weeks. Um, okay, okay. Yep. I, I liked so, it. It was very smooth, very simple. And and I expect it probably, I, I've never had any problems with uh, extra spaces or fleeting characters and gotten uh, rejected by Amazon because, hey, your 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 blurb is, is somehow screwed up technically. And and I use it all the time. And that's how I bold that first sentence, always mm -hmm. bold that, that hook and make it stand alone it's up there by itself so it jumps out like a like a neon light and then the rest of the uh the blurb uh easily shaped so it's above the fold kind of blurb because i really it's okay if they if they click read more but i want them to buy off what they see i don't want them to right. have to have, have make any extra clicks exactly so for those who might not be familiar with it uh we have a book description generator and it's it's free. You can just type it into Google. It should show up number one. Um, and when you click on it, what it does is that you can take your book description, type it in there or copy and paste it in there. And then uh, you can highlight certain parts of your book description and click buttons to make it look the way you want. More importantly, it's going to look exactly like it would on Amazon. So it shows you the right CSS, which is the right font, font size of font weight, yep. line height, spacing, all of it. So when you see it on one, you will see it on Amazon. And when you're done, you just click generate my code and it gives you that crazy gobbledygook HTML. Don't worry about it. You know what it looks like. 
copy and paste copy it paste. in. And when you publish your book, your book description will look exactly like it. But what, what Craig's talking about is that we, uh, so that was what we have right now. And it just works for Amazon. So instead though, we did a couple of things. Um, and in a couple of weeks, I'm pretty sure in two weeks, uh, we'll be releasing the brand new version of that. Again, absolutely free, no sign up, no nothing. You don't have to, you just use it, have fun. Um, but instead of it just being Amazon, we now have it where it works for Barnes and Noble, Kobo, and the editorial review section. And Amazon, of course. But what's really awesome is that as you click on the different markets, it will then show you what you can and can't do by graying out the buttons that won't work on one and bringing up the ones that will on the other. So now you don't have to fumble around and hope that this rule works for one and doesn't work for the other. You just know, and it helps you with that. And what's really awesome is you can generate, you can write your Amazon book description. You can make it look the way you want, get your code, publish it on Amazon, then click the button for Barnes and Noble and it'll immediately convert it right to Barnes and Noble. And then you can just, if it doesn't look right or you don't like how it looks on on Barnes and Noble because they actually use bigger font, uh, you can change it up. And then Kobo, they have way more things that you can do and you just change it up, generate your code and boom, just like that, you're good to go. The so only cool. one that we don't include is iTunes and that's because iTunes, when if you publish directly to iTunes, it, it's a bit crazy. Uh, you have to use their program and they have... Uh, they have so many rules on what you can and can't change. Well, they say they do. And we found out that when we were trying to research on like how to incorporate them in this tool, half the stuff they said they can won't work. And we're like, okay, this is going to be confusing because users would be like, wait a second. It says it can. Why does it your tool? And we we're like, the eh, iTunes, get your act together. So we did not include iTunes into that. But uh, you can just take, uh, I would say, the Barnes & Noble one and just put that in iTunes and it won't look exactly the same. It's not going to be the same font size exactly, but it's the close enough market, I'd say. So yeah, and that's and, the and, new version. And an important safety tip is do not use H1 because nope. that will dominate your your blurb and look really, really stupid. So yep. uh, I, I recommend, I think I use H3. For <laughs> Barnes and & Noble? I, no, for uh, for Amazon. Oh no, Amazon no longer allows H3. They only allow H4, H5, H4. and H6. Yep. And that important safety tip. So yeah, it must be H4 is the one I use. That's consistently, it's a, it's the right, it's just fairly bolded. It it stands out and that's, uh, go with that, go with that. But if you, if you grandfathered used H1, 2, or 3, then when you go, you're good, it'll stay that way. It will. Until... You make a change. As soon as you make a change, now it's the new gone. restrictions will go into place. Yeah, it's funny. Is you can almost tell how old a book description is by just looking at what font they allow. Do you remember back in the day when it, I think it was H four was orange? Yes, yes, I oh, have a few of those goodness. books still, man. I'm sorry. Uh, I love it. You know, um, <laughs> for those who don't know, your H four would actually be uh, an orange, orange header, and it yep. was so cool. And it's, I don't know, what was that, like five, six years ago? It was, no, no, man, because I've got a bunch that are in, in or, and I love those. I think it was wow. 2017 was the uh, heyday of the orange, mm. and then that ended in 2017. I think it was just like a three or four month period, and I still have a bunch of books. I, I was pub publishing a lot back then. The uh, <clears throat> um, We have a question. Yeah. Uh, can we can we request and post readers video reviews and related video shorts? Huh. Um, let's see. Can we request and post readers video reviews? And re so I guess from what I'm understanding from the question is, is that can you ask readers to create videos and then post it? I, I don't see why not. Just like you're able to ask for reviews uh, from your readers. You yeah, can even please post leave a review. Yeah, yep. please leave a review. Um, if you're sending out an email to your email list, which if you're not doing an email list, you really should. That's like <laughs> by far one of the most important tactics because of things like this, where you could just say, hey, super fans, you know, or, or people who reply to your email blast and saying, I love your book. Say, awesome. Can you just take two minutes and just shoot a, a video with your iPhone, just showing the book, talking yeah. about it, post it. It would be amazing. Yeah. I, boom. Yeah, of course you can get that totally. <clears throat> yeah. 
appreciate it. Appreciate it. And, and that's a, a request. But in the in related video shorts, I don't know. But if you're using it, you're absolutely correct. Please ask your whoever wrote it, because if they created the video of their review, that is they actually copyright that content. And that's yes. why Amazon says don't take an Amazon review and copy it over somewhere else because you have to get their permission because it's their new content, original material. So anyway, just a, 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 an important safety tip. I've done that. I've copied them over. If you if you know who the uh, reviewer is, just say, hey, can I use that real quick? Oh, sure. That's all you need. And then you can because then they've, they've licensed you to use their IP. But also, I, I'm, I am compelled to, to discuss our background. <clears throat> I'm, I'm career Marine, career Marine. Uh, uh, Dave is Navy, as, as I found out when he showed up at the 2017 conference. Thanks for coming to that. Uh, I mean, your presence and some of the other uh, uh, folks gave us legitimacy in the early in the early days of uh, 20 books to 50K. And, uh, and and you helped make that first show what it was and make it uh, uh, the, the home run that it became and the foundation for all those that followed. So thanks for uh, Thanks for showing up and sharing with us uh, back yeah, then. Absolutely. But, that was fun. But there's always a but, right? <clears throat> um, we've all got one. The uh, Dave's Navy. And uh, I see, see pictures of him in, 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 in his whites. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a source of humor for me. My wife was Navy, so it's okay. I mean, I don't have a, but, you know. So you're married when, up. There you go. I, in, indeed, indeed. <laughs> So, so people say like, "Hey, you shouldn't do that." I'm like, "Why is my taxi driver yelling at me?" And and because Dave's Dave's a, you know, they drive the boats. We uh, we ride the boats. We go do the stuff. We hop back on the boats. They feed us and bring us home. I mean, I, so I uh, <coughs> that's yeah, they're, they're, it, under understand that this is a a jovial relationship. I would never, okay. uh, I, yeah, yeah. I you know, no one I, else I'd rather go to war with because if you're over there. And there's no planes on the ground. If you know there's a plane off port and ready to pick you up, at least you've got some place you can go. And when the planes come in and you're looking at uh, all the Marines, we're not going to fit. So yes, I, I was that experience where uh, we had uh, we had five companies and uh, we only had transport for four. And I thought, hey, we're we're <laughs> we're the second company. I thought we'd be okay. I was like, hey, second, you know, and it's going to be one through four, fifth company, as always, gets a short. No, second. We had to sit behind. We were left behind when uh, when they took the initial wave out. So just understand, never bag on the people who can make your life easier. <laughs> and, and and Dave has taken that through with uh, with Publisher Rocket and his businesses to support indie authors. So thanks for that. Thanks for uh, carrying that forward. You are now completely free, right, from yes. your obligations? Yeah, I um I got into writing after the military sent me to South Korea and I had to do a two year deployment without my family. Yeah. And my wife asked me that super important question of, you know, hey, um, what what are we doing this for? Like, you know, if you got a goal, let's do it. But but if we're just going through the motions, then what's going on here? And I was like, yeah, no, I didn't have a I didn't have a desire to be an admiral or anything like that. Um, I was working in military diplomacy at the time. And, uh, but being over in Korea, you know, and working that nine to five job, but also going out to sea a lot, I didn't have the ability to start other businesses. And it wasn't until I really discovered about Amazon and that I could kind of, I, that I could write books from the other side of the world. Or <clears throat> the, the first book I ever wrote was on a, a South Korean warship, uh, you know, and by the way, I speak Chinese and English. I don't speak Korean. Um, so it was like, and they don't speak much English over there. They really don't. Uh, <laughs> so it was quite a crazy job, but I, I think that that just goes to show it doesn't matter where you are in the world or what you're doing. You can always, you can always write your book. You can always build your career. And for me, uh, my goal was to build up and no joke. It was $10,000 a month from my books in order to allow me to leave the military. And so I did that about four years, five years ago or so. Um, and then I turned in my sheets. I actually no, six years. I turned in my, my papers, uh, saying, all right, that's it. I, I, I'm done. I uh, had to finish out that tour, came here to Nashville, uh, to Franklin, Tennessee. And uh, I still did the reserves for a couple of years. A lot of that was because of, you know, their medical. And also I really, I, I did love what I do. But then after about two years of that, I'm like, okay, it, it's time. So now I am here 
uh, absolutely full time, still writing and doing doing this. So that's that's that is great to hear. So so now you and your business, what do you look at for keywords? How do you how do you exploit the system with keywords? As keywords yeah. in your your when you publish those seven blocks, how do you fill yeah. those? Well, all right. So keywords really come down to uh, knowing what people are looking for, how many people are looking for it, and whether or not books that show up are snagging the sale. And I think those are all three very important things to understand because what I found in Amazon, uh, which is unlike Google, because let's face it, they're both two search engines, right? People go type something in and then the two search engines present them with stuff. When it comes to Google, people usually type something in and they they really do click on the first couple of things that show up. In Amazon, we find ourselves doing this thing where we type something in and then we scroll and look at the covers and then we go back up to the top and then we type something else or we add something to that sentence. And all of a sudden it starts to create this chain where finally we have typed in the thing we're looking for and we'll click on the book that shows up that fits what we're looking for and then we engage and either purchase or go back and keep shopping. But the point though is, is that they have a bit of different tendencies. And so what we found is like, for example, there are a lot of people that type in like the word fantasy, okay? There, there were a lot and, and we call that the beginning of the buyer cycle. The, the person doesn't know exactly what they're looking for. They're trying to figure it out. They start off with this one word, they scroll and they realize, wow, okay, that's not the kind of fantasy I'm looking for. And they readjust what they're thinking about. And they'll say, you know, like, well, I'm really thinking like, Fan, like, I don't want to see this YA fantasy. So I need to say something that gets rid of the YA, uh, you know, yep. or they type in, <laughs> heaven forbid, they type in werewolf, you know, um, they're like, whoa, whoa, no, no, not romance. I, I wanted like real, like horror. And then they add, the I wanted horror. real werewolves. Right. <laughs> not and so they, they type in something. So now the, the, the phrase goes from <laughs> werewolf to then werewolf horror. And then all of a sudden they're looking, they say, okay, these are all modern times. I was thinking something more like lichens, you know, back in the day, like I want something medieval, knights, medieval. And all of a sudden we start getting into these really weird grouping of words as that person starts from their buyer's journey and then finally resolves to where they're looking. And it's, it's crazy because you're going to see terms that just don't, they don't like, you know, like we just saw here, right? Werewolf, horror, knights, medieval. And that's when you've given so many points. And that that phrase there will probably convert way better than the phrase that's like werewolf. Because what are the chances that Amazon figured it out and presented the perfect werewolf book to you just off the one word werewolf? So yeah. we find ourselves in this point where there are well, so some, many combinations. And, and keep in mind, some people exploit that with their ads because they're going to dominate that that physical space on the screen oh, yeah. by paying a dollar seventy five a click or whatever ridiculous amount it takes to get the number one return on the word fantasy or werewolf, and that's probably does and especially if they're not searching specifically Kindle books, yep. it's going to be movies. Movies are spending that kind of money to get the to get the real estate. Exactly. And you're going to find yourself running into the situation where, you know, you go after fantasy and you're paying a huge penny. But here's what I love, though, is, is that if you put in like fantasy and you put in broad match or something, you're giving Amazon the opportunity to kind of find other things as well. Um, and they'll find. So maybe <coughs> somebody typed in werewolf, fantasy, horror, medieval knights, and nobody's targeting that. But because maybe you put in like fantasy, werewolf or whatever, uh, Amazon will then add those other two words you know, and it allows you to show up for it. And one of the things that's really cool now on Amazon ads, I know we're kind of jumping, jumping ship here for a second, but I'm really yeah. loving it is that when you set your, when you set up your keyword, say on Amazon ads for something like that, you can now look at the actual phrase that got the sale. Um, you can go into your ads campaign, you can click on the keywords and then it will show you the real word. Now I love using this information, not just for my ads, but also for my natural keywords as well, because I can start to find some things. I'm like, whoa, I didn't think of that word. I didn't even know Regency was a thing. I Apparently it's not medieval. It should have been Regency. Uh, yeah. That's a time period. I, I'm sorry. I'm through keywords, I'm learning a lot about how we classify time periods. Apparently, there's a time period called gas lamp. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Re really? Like, I, I mean, it makes sense when somebody explains it to me. But um, <laughs> anyways, but the, the thing is, is that I can start looking at these words. And these are the words 
These are the exact words that somebody typed into Type. Amazon yep. and then clicked on my book and then purchased it. Yep. Nothing else out there that gives you more information. So even if you're hesitant about the ads, give it some broad phrases and start learning about what is converting. And you can use that for other things. Use that for your natural keywords as well. Um, but it, but anyways, coming back to your natural keywords, what we're finding though is that it is those really weird phrases that are truly the converters because again, we went from the buyer's path of, I don't really know what I'm looking for and I'm just keep adding words until I finally hit the point where it's like, oh, Snapple, that's that's it. Those are the books I'm looking for. Um, you know, I, I talked about Lit RPG. The funny thing is I'm not a gamer, <laughs> even though I love reading Lit RPG. However, though, I discovered the term Lit RPG because of a path like that. Um, as a matter of fact, I was looking for books like Ready Player One. I was researching <clears throat> that and I and and I kept adding things as I went until I finally was like, oh, snap, that's it. So I, uh, you I, I have to say that I had uh, I had breakfast when I was in Moscow. I had breakfast with Vasily Mahanenko, one of the original six Russians who defined and built the lit RPG genre. No he was one of the original authors in the and and that's it. I said all I know about uh, lit RPG is Ready Player One, and he. I thought I freaking. You'd think I stabbed oh, him with a oh, harpoon. Oh, good lord! Those are fighting well, words. It, well, because lit Red, Ready Ready Player One is cyberpunk and not lit RPG. So, oops, missed it by that much, and uh, and and then was corrected. And my Russian's not bad, but I, I I couldn't follow his corrections, so he actually poked it up in uh, in Russia. He spoke it to his his phone, and had it translated, and then showed me the error of my ways. So, <clears throat> but 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 still, you found it because that that causal relationship is there. Because I'm not the only one who misunderstood Ready Player One as lit RPG. And when you get in real lit, and and this goes for all other genres too. There, yes. there is confusion, and as I, as I, complete continuously harp on, genre equals marketing. Mm -hmm. Don't go in thinking that, hey, here's my genre, and you've got it so sub niched, you've you've uh, uh, narrowed yourself right out of the market. What what I hear you saying is, you want fantasy, but then you want to then taper it, not taper it first, and then try to expand. Right. Exactly. And, you know, another thing to go with that, which is it's funny that you brought that example up because when I talked about uh, Ready Player One, that was like one of my biggest cardinal sins, I guess, to, to Lit RPG was that I thought it was. But here's the thing, though, that got me in, in, interested in it. I loved that it, it, book so much. I wanted more books like it. And that sent me down a path to learn not only that I like Lit RPG, but even more so, I like Game Lit. Lit RPG yeah. Game Lit books. Yeah. Three years ago, I didn't even know those things existed. I think I'd heard of Lit RPG, but it's super game related, not book related. But yeah, game, game my Lit did path, not exist three years right. ago. That, no, that, that and, came about. Yeah, but that's how that's how I shop now. I just go into Amazon, I check out the latest Lit RPG game lit, and I type that in, and then I'll type <clears> Lit RPG game lit ogres and you know or dungeons, and yeah, you know, that's where I find books like Dungeon Lord or um, uh, the, Rogue the Dungeon or. Anything like, like Dakota Dungeons. Kraut. <laughs> oh yeah, Dakota Kraut for sure. Um, you know, James Hunter is 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 another phenomenal. Like, anyways, sorry, I'm just geeking out about uh, lit RPG. But my point though is, is that we as we as shoppers, we start to develop this habit of just combining all these words. So let's bring this back to your seven Kindle keywords, right? When you go to publish your book, you have the seven boxes. And back in the day, people used to argue back and forth, kind of like you should put the one phrase in there and that's it. Or you should fill up that box with as many words as possible, you know, to get the most out of it. And if you don't know, you can put up to 50 characters, that's letter and space. So that's what a character is, is a letter or space or symbol or whatever. You can put 50 of them in there. Um, so people would use all 50 characters and try to put them, uh, put as many words in. So to try to break this and to try to understand what the right uh, decision should be, should you just do the the specific phrase or as many words. We set up this um, uh, experiment where we had a whole bunch of Kindlepreneur email people. Thank you, by the way, if any of you guys are listening um, and you submitted your information for that, uh, you see me at the bar, I'll buy you a drink or a cookie on it. Love, love it and thank you. And we do a lot of surveys to try to 
get real information from a large amount of authors. Um, so any of you guys take it again, I just want to say thank you. So we had a bunch of people who submitted their keywords. They sent their keywords to us, what they put in those seven boxes. They listed what genre they were, whether they were fiction or nonfiction. And we then looked at them and we asked, okay, did this person specifically put the phrase or did they put as many phrases as possible? And uh, my team at Rocket, we designed this crawler just for the experiment because uh, it's god awfully expensive. Um, and but we had it crawl all of Amazon as much as possible, and to find where the book ranked for what keywords, not just the keywords they put in, but for anything else. And then we asked them to change their keywords to the other thing, whether it was all fifty characters or if it was you know specific. And then we monitored to see what happened or to see what actually ended up happening. And what we found was this. If you put as many words into the uh, into the keyword box, Amazon indexed you, that means shows you for more, uh, for way more things, or like a lot more, okay? Uh, that And what we found from this was that Amazon was taking, so say you had four words in there, okay? It was taking just about every combination of those four words, as well as pluralization and, and things like that, and they were putting you somewhere in, in the results for those phrases, if the phrase existed, okay? So if if you can type in like a full sentence in Amazon, Amazon, I'll come back and be like, nah, dude, there's nothing to show here, you know? Um, well, if, that, if there's no result for it, then it won't index for it. But we found that you index for all those things. So a lot of you may be saying, snap, that's it. I'm just gonna fill up the boxes. But here's what we found on the specific ones where the person just put in the specific phrase is that yes, they ranked for that. And more importantly, they ranked higher initially. Okay, so they would jump up. So maybe all those 200 other phrases that you were combined with to be a part of, those you might be ranking like 1000 or 2000, you know? Whereas with the specific phrase that you have in there, uh, the person could potentially jump right to the first page or second page or third page of the results. So what we found was the best situation is if you have a combination <clears throat> of both. And I would say that if you've done your research and you know that there's a particular phrase that's really good for you, you know, it gets searches, people are buying, it's a good fit. It really is a good fit. I want to stress that part. It is, uh, is important. Right, because let's face it, if you rank there and it's not a good fit, then the shoppers will not click on you and they will not buy and it doesn't help you. So if you have those phrases that are those three things we talked about, then just put those phrases by themselves. Then on the other ones, fill in all the other ways of describing things and just fill up those boxes. And we found that when you do that, your combination of those two things give you the most bang for your buck. Okay. What do you get when you change keywords? Because you go through and, and your book matures over time. Uh, when you change your keywords, do you get re-indexed? Yes. As a matter of fact, really quickly. Um, we, okay. it's what we're finding. And I, there's a, I saw enough results that I can say this with certainty uh, from our previous ones, but I want to set up another um, experiment to really dig a bit deeper. And the funny thing is that every time I do these experiments, I always be like, Oh, I should have, I should have done that. You know, like I should ask that. Um, for example, that seven kilo keywords one, I should have analyzed whether or not words in one box also can mix with words of another box. Yeah. I didn't look into that. So I'm like, I'm just kind of hit myself over that. Um, but anyways, what we found was, was that when you, and by the way, Amazon tells you change your, like they actually, they've updated, I think their FAQ section for metadata now. Uh, there's a new page and it's it's got more information, which is great. And they tell you, change them up, like change them up from time to time. And the way it sounds like from their sentences, it kind of revitalizes your book a bit. Like they yeah. notice it, they'll they'll get it indexed within 24 hours and it kind of shoots it up a bit because now here's a new thing to test. Yeah. Um, and so and, and, and an important safety tip here for somebody like me, I have over 100 books. You only really need to change those keywords on the first book because you're hoping mm. the first book is what sells the second, the set, third, fourth. So just just don't don't 100%. be overwhelmed. The first book in a series, that's all, that's the only one you really need to keep playing with unless your blurb really sucks in your other books. So no sucky blurbs and get those keywords, play with the keywords, refresh it, advertise that first book and and then you won't be overwhelmed. Yeah, and uh, to add to that, um 
one thing I do recommend to people that are changing their keywords, don't change all of them at the same time. I would say pick two boxes and change them and see if it helps or hurts. And the reason why I say that is because you never know which keyword combination right now is driving the most uh, traffic slash sales. Um, there could be one combination that you are just crushing it, that Amazon loves you there, that they put you at the top of that keyword combination right at the top and people who type it in are clicking and buying it. And you don't want to take that away and be like, oh, just kidding, Amazon, you know, I don't, don't index me there anymore. Index me for this. Like, and, and it's okay if you do that mistake, then you know it's one of the two boxes that, that you know, that was it, not seven. So, so keep a record. my recommendation, exactly, keep a record, change two at a time, see how it goes. If you see it increase, then great. Then maybe a couple of days later, choose another two. And if you do this process systematically, you'll find that more most optimal combination and that can really help. Sounds good. Good advice there. Uh, the, uh, we have a question on screen. Are there any plans for a UK version of Rocket? Oh, you better believe it. Yes. Uh, hi, yeah. Lane. Hi. Um, yeah, we are definitely uh, like, I don't know, month or so away from that. Um, for those who don't know, we have the German version uh, on Rocket already. Uh, we didn't announce it. Um, and the reason why we didn't announce it was because Amazon German's been a really bit weird. Um, it's kind of a, it's kind of funny how they're all Amazons, but they're not. Uh, they do things no, so differently. No. Yep. And it, it drives, as, as a programmer, <clears throat> it drives us bonkers. Um, it's really complicated working with all the different Amazons and keeping all the balls juggling up in the air and working at all times. Um, so that's why we've been very slow and systematic. The other thing too, is we had to make sure that our, our data was as accurate as possible. Um, as, as your friend Craig uh, helped us um, uh, with it, we found that we had a bug that was like huge. So we've been really um, slow to come out with them because we really don't want there to be problems. So we've been working with publishing companies in the countries in the UK and in Germany uh, to really analyze their data and help us to kind of make sure that what we're showing in German and UK are appropriate and legitimate. The other thing too, is as we're coming out with new features for the US version, we wanna make sure that we have the same thing for the, for the UK and German as well. Um, but the thing that we ran into with German that they just did recently, and I'm sure maybe some of you guys heard that Amazon made some changes. That's what kind of killed Yasev, uh, Yasev.com. Um, the German market decided to stop sending information on books, physical books. So we have all the Kindle, but we can't present the books. So on the German version right now, if you click on it, you can do everything uh, that you can on the US version for Kindle in, in Germany. And once, and from what I've understood from our com conversations with them is they're fixing it, but they're pretty slow. <laughs> um, so we're waiting for them to fix that. It's it's on their side. It's their issue. And once they do that, then we'll have full data for book and ebook. And then we'll make sure, you know, big announcement. But for you guys listening right now, as a little part, you guys can click on that map in the top right. You can start doing your German stuff. Um, and I would honestly take a look at doing German ads, uh, even if you didn't translate your book from uh, into German. And if you did, Definitely do Amazon ads. Holy moly. That's like the wild, wild west right now. Yeah, um, yeah. But English books that have been that have been done well, okay, that have a good cover. There are a lot of English reading Germans on the German market, and they're hungry for a lot of these books. And so people who are mm -hmm. doing that are seeing some very good success right now. Oh, and the, and the German readers who read in German are hungry for more oh, content for good con now good content yes it, it can't be it can't be something that isn't resonating right now and thrillers are thrillers mm -hmm. are, are getting pretty damn big in germany i know uh uh <clears throat> the uh the, the paranormal the urban fantasy there's certain urban fantasy that's doing well and michael anderley is 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 getting into that market wholesale oh my and goodness, uh, and and uh winning leading to much winning along with uh, Mark Dawson, much winning with plans to expand. Uh, uh, I know Joseph Alexander with his nonfiction books on playing guitar. He's huge in Germany <clears throat> because his books are majority are, are major pictures showing the, the, the layouts and the music. So he's translating a little bit, but it's very technical. So it's not anything to be done quickly, but those books, he's like, those are, those are killing it in Germany. So yeah. the, the, the opportunity 
expand. Don't jump into Germany. You've got one book. You've sold eight copies. It's like, oh, I better get into Germany. Relax there, big husky. It's expensive. So uh, you, you, you want to incrementally work your way into Germany because if a book isn't selling here, you need to figure that out before you can go elsewhere and sell 100%. it. Yeah, if you have a successful book here, um, that is the first step to <clears> thinking <throat> about publishing it in Germany. Um, if, if your book is doing well here, then definitely try some ads without translating your book in German and see if that's really taking off. And if that's happening and you're seeing sales, then that's another indication that maybe you should look at paying the, the price to have a good translator translate your book and then run it in the German market. Um, it's a step-step process, but what's really cool is you can use data for every step of the way. Definitely don't say, oh, my book isn't selling in America. Maybe it will sell in Germany. It's a, uh, probably won't work that way. Um, no. But definitely something to keep in mind. Another thing that's coming out too is that um, the uh, we have a new feature that I haven't exactly announced, kind of to an extent, and we have had it in play actually for over a year now. Uh, and we have been collecting all data on every Amazon category. That's all 14,000 categories. So pretty soon we will be updating a, uh, there's a, we'll be updating our category feature. And what you'll be able to see is you'll still be able to see all the information that you see, you know, like for example, how many books that day you need to sell to be number one. Uh, but we're also gonna show you sales trends. You're gonna be able to see how sales are trending in that category. You can see if it's going up, if it's going down, if it's seasonal. Um, and so we'll have all these <clears> graphs that that right there for you to see, you know, and you can quickly tell, boom, hey, this one's, this is how much money the top books are making for that category. Here's the sales trends. Um, and again, that, that'll be 100% free for all current owners and it's not gonna be a subscription. So you can just enjoy cool. category so data. So on that one, the category is a sub, sub, sub. You, you dominate the subcategory, mm -hmm. and uh, but that one will tell you, hey, you're dominating the subcategory. You always get your bestseller tag and you're making $8. Yeah. So it'll it'll relate the two that, hey, the best is that bestseller tag worth $8 that you want to fleet up to higher categories and compete in a bigger market. That's always something to keep in mind. It's cool to have the bestseller tag, but it's even cooler to make money. So it, it's time for a short break because I need to bag on you about your hair. That, that uh, you got some crazy shit going on. It looks like about a four day growth on your beard. So I can only assume <laughs> that you're going feral. Yeah. Well, you know, I actually just cut my own hair, but uh, when I was on the submarine though, I had to cut my own hair all the time. So uh, it was, it was a trade skill that I learned. I mean, on a submarine, you have to be your own pastor. You have to be your own doctor. Cause I mean, sure they got a doctor, but yeah. you don't want to go to him. <laughs> no. <laughs> Corbin, my finger, it's gone. It's gone. Here, take some motion, go sleep on it. That would be like, it was always take some motion and sleep on it. Um, so we were our own doctor, we were our own dentist, we were our own hairdressers. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's like we're right now in this quarantine. I'm like, I got it. I'll cut my own hair. I'm good. I got it. I got it. Yeah, my wife, I put the clippers together yesterday. I haven't braved uh, getting uh, running it over. I'm just going to do a buzz uh, with a, a 10 millimeter thing on my clipper. So that's a, uh, it'll work. It, nice. I mean, you can see it's going anyway. Who? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, my, my son, uh, he's got a giant mop on his head. Uh, oh, and I'm just like, I'm like, oh, can I buzz it? And he's like, no, dad. Like, come, yeah, on, that's, that's, come on. Let me just give it a buzz. High and tight, buddy. No, summer's dad. coming. You should just shave it. Summer's coming. You should right? just shave it. So, yeah. so the, Dave Chesson is here. Let's see some more questions. I saw one question that I don't really want to answer because we can't. We can't really speak to, uh, let's see, Laura asked, the. Uh, we can't speak to why people had their Amazon accounts closed. It's uh, it, it's an Amazon decision initially, and, and I work a lot with Amazon. I've worked very closely with them. And <clears throat> what they said is there's initial listing that they get of, hey, here's, here's possible uh, uh, variations that don't look right. And then people review that. So if somebody had their account closed, it was because people reviewed it. Mm -hmm. And what we found is most people who have lost their accounts have not been completely honest in social media regarding why they lost. I didn't do anything. Well, it turns out like four out of five actually did. And, and well, they may not have thought it was bad. Amazon did. <clears throat> and also 
we know people who have sued Amazon and gone to arbitration and then lost because Amazon has the trump card. Mm. They can determine who uses their site or don't. They, they don't have to give you a reason and they can terminate your account. So if this is the, the distributor that owns 85% of the ebook market in the world, you know, you don't want to run afoul of them. So metadata, you have no idea what made it, metadata was actually used or if somebody actually in, inserted metadata into their Mobi files or their files that were then converted in order to then trigger different res, uh, responses from the algorithms or the, the uh, Amazon software that drives this whole train. So this is, you know, I don't know. I, I, uh, all I can say is play by the rules. Dave's telling you, here's optimally what you do. Find those phrases. Keep some general, keep some very specific. Don't pollute the ones and, and, and go after the market that way. Don't exploit it with anything that might be shady. I actually, Dungeons and Dragons is a category on, on, on Amazon for eBooks. And I used that as one of my natural keywords and that held up a book. Mm -hmm. That held up a book uh, as it, and uh, it didn't get published. Five days later, I'm like, hey, 72 hours has passed. Why is this book not live? And I said, I know I use this keyword, but it's one of your categories. So can I have that keyword to get into this category and get get a response from these readers? Here's why this book relates. Here's my co-author on this book who worked for TSR. And so I sent that letter and lo and behold, the book got published. So even, even uh, you know, I got that look of, hey, you're using, you're using metadata that could be trademarked, copyrighted. Because one thing you cannot use in your your natural keywords is Tom Clancy. They save those words for the advertising. So you can't use other authors' names. You can't use trademark like Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Don't use that as one of your natural keywords. Is do you have more insight on that, Dave? To be more so because you're yeah. you're more definitive. Yeah, when it comes to so metadata, like you. you kind of like what Craig was saying, you have to be pretty egregious, like egregious to get them to trigger something uh, because there's just way too many things to interpret um, where, but what I will say about the Amazon and I, my team always knows this, I call them the Amazon humans. Um, sometimes you just get some of the humans that you're just like, you, you really suck at your job. Like you, you like, like, I, I don't know what it is. Um, it's one of the things, for example, you can add and change your categories. Sometimes you'll get one of those Amazon humans who will be like, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to change your categories. It's like you have a form specifically that I filled out for changing my categories. How can yep. I not? I'm sorry, sir, but you cannot yeah. change your category. So what you do is you just reapply and then you get a new human and they're like, yep, no problem. All good. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And, and, and I don't this know, is sometimes you get that person who's new to the job or who, who just woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And I, I got into an argument once where one of my books got held up because my title, um, they, they thought it was misleading. And it was like, you know, like I went back and forth. Finally, I was like, I'm sorry, is English your first language? Because there is absolutely nothing misleading. Can you please send me to somebody else? Like I, I got pretty irate and they sure enough, I got another person that responded. And they're like, yep, nope, this is good. Published it immediately. Uh -huh. Clear. Because it was yep. obviously not the case. So sometimes you will get that human who is just off. But when it comes to metadata, it really has to be egregious for A, Amazon to, to hold it up, okay? Uh, or B, especially to do a ban hammer. Um, I mean, you put Dungeon and Dragons in there, they didn't give you a ban hammer. So it's, yeah. I would say if somebody comes in and does say it's metadata, there was a lot more going. There were a lot of red flags that triggered for them to just give it a drop. And maybe they just replied that it was metadata just to make, you know, with their yeah. copy yes. and paste response, automatic response. They just said metadata, but that might've been one of like 30 things that triggered their automation and, system. And we know that people have had their accounts canceled and then appealed and said, please, this isn't, no, I, I, I you know, unintentional or something, or I outsourced my, uh, my formatting. And so I just uploaded what I got. I will use a different formatter. Somebody might be trying to do their their author's favors. And this mm -hmm. is no, no, that kind of stuff. Because And people have gotten their accounts reinstated. And there are people who have crossed the line and then admitted it and said yes and gotten their accounts reinstated. Once they make peace with Amazon and say, this is, I'm sorry, this isn't, you know, I, 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 I won't do this again. This isn't what I really was trying to accomplish. So 
Uh, keep that in mind, not casting aspersions on anyone. Just understand that for, for Amazon to whip out the ban hammer, they have to, a group of people, it's not just one, has to, to say, this is this is egregious and uh, mm-hmm. you need to go. And then, of course, they have the trump card with, hey, you, this is Amazon. We just don't want you on our site. Uh, a couple of questions that we have pop up. Um, so it's awesome because in the comments, we just noticed somebody who said it, it like, hey, are they still accepting more categories because they only allow me three? And then somebody's like responded, yes, I did it three times until I finally got one. I'm just telling you, that's a prime example of the humans, the Amazon humans, and they just don't know their job and you get the wrong one and they just reply like they know the answer and they do not. So just yeah, I, restart the I process, in, go right back to I the s- form, fill it out again. I sent in a request for two books to get uh, seven different categories today. Yep. And well, and my thing is I get them on the phone. <laughs> um, if you live in the US, just click, put in your phone number. Uh, I think it's US and Canada. Uh, there might be more countries. They always add and change. Um, and they immediately call you within two minutes. You pick up the phone and you talk to them. Um, and then if that person doesn't work out, just resubmit the phone and then you get another human. And yeah, it, and it doesn't sure. happen often, but it does happen. And if it does happen to you, yeah. don't lose you know, faith. Just do it again. It's just Amazon humans. Uh, that's my and, favorite and that's, term. And, I don't mean to and, be de- and make degrading. Sure, make sure you have that whole string of, uh, of where you want to put the cat- category. Don't just say, hey, I, I need to put it in space opera. Well, yeah, there's no different, different space. You need to give them the whole string. Exactly. And that that's key is, is to get that complete category string. Um, don't just get the title at the top of the category page because it will say bestseller, mm-hmm. uh, romance, or whatever dark dark romance, but oh hey, okay, somebody beat us to it and published. Hey, hey, somebody beat us to it and show, uh, pasted in an example. So let me. Uh, right. There we go. There we go. Um, because if you do that, do understand that dark romance could also be under romance, young adult. Uh, hopefully not children, but I, who knows? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and and but there's uh, literature and fiction. There's all these places where a dark romance category could z- exist and either a the human decides to just put you in one of those and you end up in children's and you know great now you're in children's like uh or ya you're listed as a ya or exotica uh if they put it put you in that you know great getting, oh my god good luck getting yourself out of that one. Um, oh my god that's a tough one right or they just say no that's you know they'll just tell you you can't do that instead of saying i'm sorry but that's not a complete category string and so you keep resending the same thing make sure to have the full category string. It makes it so much better. Uh, another person, good, by the way, oh, go ahead. Looking for looking for categories. One of our members is a programmer and you can go to Booklinker. I think it's B-K-L-N-K-E-R or, or something like that. Can somebody share that uh, that link, please? And you can, you can go to, I think, cat listing, type mm-hmm. in your ASIN and it will give you every category that he can scrape and that shows for your book. So then you can find out definitively, here are the categories where your, that ASIN resides. And um, there's also a tool on a website called nerdybookgirl.com that does the same thing as well. Um, but yeah. for the Publisher Rocket users, uh, we have a, we're, we used to have the feature back in the day uh, called uh, Unleash the Categories, where you would be able to quickly look at exactly what categories were there. Amazon took that way, that that uh process away but they've given it back so we'll be re-releasing the unleash the categories and what's really cool is that in publisher rocket and that should be next week okay next week or the week, i think we just have to do the redo the tutorial videos and then we'll be good to go but when you're in the competition analyzer you can click on a book and see its list of categories that it's a part of or you can see all the categories for all the books in that competition analyzer just like that you can export them um copy and paste them into the form and should be good to go. So that should be coming out next week as a free upgrade. So man, look at that! Look at that! Yeah, it's, it's cool being an author and and uh, always asking. You know, like uh, it would be nice if. And I was like, oh, why not? So um, another thing that I saw somebody post just a bit ago uh, was somebody said that back in the day, our Amazon Ads uh, feature, our AMS feature on on Rocket. Um, used to be really crystal clear. We'd get all these. And then all of a sudden we shifted to where there's a lot of questionable books showing up in those. Um, one thing I would make sure whoever that was that posted it is make sure you're on the latest version, which is if memory serves me. I think it's like 2.0.45. Um, 
I could just open up mine and check to see what the version number is. Yeah, 2.0.45. And um, because what happened was we've had to shift some things inside of the Amazon ads, like what it would present. And we added a section where it would it would pull the categories of the top two books, and then it would list the top best-selling books in that category. Uh, that's caused a lot of problems because sadly, there are a lot of people who put their books in, into things that they shouldn't. And so you might put in there like sci-fi military and you get an erotica book or you know a romance book or something like that showing up. You're like, what the heck? Um, or, you know, this book on money uh, puts itself in in a category on like um, uh, orphans, you know, because maybe at some point they talked about the author was in an orphanage. And so therefore it's an orphan book. And now you have a whole list of orphan books that are popping up. Um, you know, so we had a lot of issues with that. We also used to be able to show books that Amazon thought were similar. Uh, this was like a little inside code that we found. Um, it, it's really weird, but there's nothing on Amazon sales page that would show the, this list of books they thought. It is not also bots. It is not similar books. It is just <laughs> these books that for some reason, Amazon tagged as these are similar books. And we found it in their code and we are like, cool, this should be great. We should post this because, um, and in truth, what we found is you had much lower cost per click for those books. The problem is, is that Amazon's thoughts on what is similar sucks. Like, I mean, it just sucks. <laughs> like they would, uh, and we also found too, that sometimes Amazon would, um, and this is a, a, a phenomenon we've started to find, by the way, is that, and this might be an answer to whoever that was, if they are on the latest version, this might be the case. We have found a phenomenon where if you put in a keyword phrase and it is a phrase or so that Amazon believes, like, yes, people go there, but they haven't been able to sell a darn thing for some reason, they will start putting bestseller books that have nothing to do with that subject, just because, hey, people are showing up, might as well show them something that sells because these other yeah. books don't. A great example of this was just recently, somebody uh, had a book and it was on how to buy a dog. Um, and, and that was basically the general gist of it was how to buy a dog. And the truth is, is that people were searching for how to buy a dog. Um, there's definitely searches. The problem is, is that the, the two books that were on how to buy a dog, uh, one was absolutely free and that wasn't the person's. And then the person's was straight up that. Well, the thing is, is that people were typing it in and Amazon couldn't sell those books. Uh, so Amazon started putting a memoir, uh, a book called a memoir at the top. And then they would put <laughs> another one. Um, and, and it was like, it was their way of just saying, well, let's just throw something that converts. You know, something that's people have been buying, just put it in front of those people just in case, because we can't seem to sell um, books on the subject. So I would say to anybody, if you're doing your keyword research or you're looking on Amazon, you think that there's this great niche or something like that. If you see some book that has nothing to do with that keyword term, but it's a popular book, turn around and walk away. Uh, that That's a sheer sign that that is not a good keyword because, or unless you can answer why nobody's buying those books. Okay. Yeah. So uh, one of the two, but most of the time it's going to end up being that. So if you're on the Amazon ads feature and you type in one of those phrases, you may get a list of best selling books that have nothing to do with it because that's Amazon search result, which we do pull that information for our Amazon ads and they're putting them up there and it's kind of their Amazon's basically, yeah, we suck at this. <laughs> we don't know what to do. We just want to make some money. So we'll throw some. Well, well and also if, if you have a book that's not selling, and you put it in there, that's how you get that result. So you have to have some sales in order to develop uh, a trend, yes. you know, three data points for a trend. Well, when you're selling books, it's a lot more than that, that you really need to define a trend. So if you have a book, if you have a book that's selling well, then you will get very good trends, just like those bestsellers. Hey, these books sell well, so they must be doing something right. Search Absolutely. that specifically and see what else aligns. And it's like, okay, even if it has nothing to do with your book, it'll give you insight into how Amazon thinks. And that's what we're trying to, uh, that's what Dave has been able to he, make educated guesses. It's still guesses yep. <clears throat> because it's scraping uh, publicly available data. <clears throat> no, you cannot, there's no secret trick to go in and see exactly what people put as their natural keywords. People are like, oh, hey, if you do this on, yeah, no, show the code nope. now. You, you don't see their natural keywords. Um, so just, just understand that this is all part, just like Michelle talked about yesterday, this is all part of doing 
your personal research to improve your odds of making that sale. And one of the best things you can do is you get that blur bright. You get the cover that's eye-catching and all things that we've talked about before, but every time we talk about them, it gets reiterated. The heat map is great and we look forward to seeing that. We're at 65 minutes, so we got to kind of wrap it up. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I, I really appreciated having you on, Dave. Always, always appreciate your insight because you actually, you study this stuff. I mean, like nobody else studies this stuff. And how is your, how is your own book going? Good, yeah. Um, getting a lot more writing done, which is awesome. Um, also putting together more videos. Um, my, my daughter, who's my video editor, she's home, which is, which is great. Not great for her, but you know, but, you uh, know so. she's not playing softball, man. She's not playing ball. Yeah, I know. Um, this was, this but, was her year. This was her, she was going to lead the league, man. She was going to be a yeah. national, uh, all, she was going to be on the, on the national all-star team. If she had had like, so little, little dad gloating, um, little proud dad, but, uh, if she so she plays d1 softball for lehigh um and she's she's their their lead hitter uh she was a sophomore this year if she had been in one more game she would have been ranked number one in d1 softball for home runs per game and she would have been in the top five for batting average um but she didn't she needed one more game to qualify for that ranking and they didn't get to play it they they'd canceled the league uh but, well she played off. every game so it's not there was nothing on her she played yeah. every game, right? Well, no, yeah. she got injured for the first five. That's why she wasn't oh. automatically. Okay. Um, okay. She had a hamstring in injury, so she missed one tournament, one weekend, and that was it. And But that was five games. So she needed one more to then qualify as a full-time player. Um, but she played every game, uh, and she never sat out for all the other games. But, yeah, she missed it by one. Um, one thing I know um, we were wrapping up, but I saw a Facebook user said, yep, I'm on 2.0.45, but still get the bad results if I put in – uh, an ASIN, which used to work. Yes, that is true. ASIN's got a little weird with Amazon. One of the things that I'm really tackling with my team right now, and I didn't know this. I actually really did not know that people uh, were using the Amazon ads feature by taking the ASI number and they were getting some really great results back in the day. Um, so uh, it's funny is now that there's a problem, now I know how that was being used. And I was like, that's really cool. Um, I'm right now working with my team to create an ASIN analyzer kind of like a new feature it's something we're experimenting with i can't promise what we're doing but i really want to dig in and to get more information about books based off of the asin so this would be and also i'm looking at doing <coughs> something about authors as well put in an author and learn everything you need to know about the author how much they're making in total uh what their best books are like so we're trying to focus on those two general areas but yeah there's a lot to asin and it really needs some fine tune tuning and some programming in order to get the right information out of it. So um, whoever that was, we are working on that. Uh, I'm experimenting. Cool. Hopefully I'll have cool. great stuff soon. Ah, yeah, different issue than what I was thinking of. So good good on you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yeah. Appreciate, look forward to all the new uh, the new rollouts over the next month. You're gonna be, <clears throat> it's gonna be great. Uh, and Dave is always a, uh, a professional when it comes to customer service and come to uh, any of any of the uh, uh, his products. So look them up and uh, definitely we will see you in November. You bet. That's what it's all about, man. Everybody's going to need to get out of the house. And on a final note, I tr we have Robin Cutler tomorrow from Ingram Spark. And uh, the final note is I'm envious of Dave's hair. Everybody have a great day, and uh, we will see you tomorrow. Thanks, Dave. Hey, thank you, guys. Take care.